Joining me to talk about India-Pakistan relations is former High Commissioner to Pakistan, Satyar Bratpal, former Foreign Secretary, Kamal Sibyl, the senior writer of India Today, Jyoti Malhotra, and also with us, former Pakistan High Commissioner to India, Aziz Ahmed Khan. Satyar Bratpal, yesterday Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif said, before starting dialogue with India, I have decided to consult the Kashmiri leaders. After Mr. Modi and the Indian government made it clear that this would not be acceptable to India, do you see this as a snub to the Indian Prime Minister or simply a reiteration of Pakistan's well-known traditional position? I would see it as a reiteration. He was also speaking in Muzaffarabad. And there, of course, he would have to say for domestic political compulsions that firstly, Kashmir was central to Pakistan's foreign policy and that Kashmiri leaders would be consulted. So we have to also take into account the context in which he said this. But given that context, are you suggesting that he doesn't mean it, he's only saying it because he has to, or does he mean it, and is this in fact his position? Well, he is a politician. Whether he means it or not, time will tell. But at the moment, I'm sure he has stated a position, which is a formal, known Pakistani position, and in the, in the context in which he said it, he could have said nothing else. Aziz Ahmed Khan, the Indian position is a very clear and simple one. Pakistan should either talk to the Indian government or to the Kashmiri separatists who want to break up this country. You can't, the Indian government says, speak to both. Why is that not an acceptable position for your Prime Minister? If we are seriously trying to resolve the Kashmir issue, which needs resolution and it, which would require uh, think, uh, thinking deeply, how can you find a solution to an issue about a people without consulting those people and without knowing the wishes of those people? The whole question about Kashmir is to find a solution which is acceptable not only to India and Pakistan but also to the people of Kashmir and that only way to ascertain that is to talk to the Kashmiris. Yeah, that is quite a compelling point Kamal Sibyl. After all, they are the people whose land or territory is in dispute. It's their futures that we are talking about. Doesn't the Pakistani position have a certain validity? How can you sort out Kashmir without consulting I, the Kashmiri I, people? Uh, no, uh, frankly, I find it a very specious argument. Uh, our Prime Minister or our leaders are not saying that uh, Nawaz Sharif or anybody else uh, should not talk to the so-called Kashmiri leaders on the other side. That's not our position. What we're saying is you can't talk uh, to the separatists on our side. If there is a responsibility to consult the Kashmiri leaders and the Kashmiri people, the responsibility is on the shoulders of the Indian government. We have to talk to them. Pakistan can't assume overlordship and extraterritorial rights on Indian citizens on this side and, and therefore arrogate to themselves the right to talk to them in order to ascertain their wishes. Their wishes have to be ascertained by us. So I, I see no problem in if, if Nawaz Sharif wants to talk to the leaders in, in uh, POK, let him go ahead and do it. We should have no objection okay. to that. B before I come to Jyoti Bhrota, let me put Kamal Sibyl's point back to Aziz Ahmed Khan. Why are you saying that the right or the duty or the prerogative or responsibility of talking to separatist leaders on the Indian side lies with you? No doubt they have to be consulted, but that's a responsibility for the Indian government to fulfill, not for the Pakistanis to intervene in. Well, when you are uh, discussing an issue which, is, which involves a dispute and where there are in different interpretation as far as we are concerned we are talking to the leaders of a territory this is which is in dispute and we have to find it an amicable resolution to that so that should include all the leaders who um, reside in that territory the entire territory which is in dispute you know despite what you're hearing this moment from Aziz Ahmed Khan Jyoti Blota, the truth is that in New York Sartaj Aziz actually said something different in two very important critical respects. First of all, he said the timing of talks with the separatists before the Foreign Secretary's meeting wasn't necessarily correct. In fact, I think he actually went on to say it was a mistake. And secondly, he said there was no need for the talks to have to precede talks with the Indian government. They could just as easily happen after talks with the Indian government. 
Now, Nawaz has clearly moved away from that position in terms of what he said in Muzaffarabad. Has he done so under army pressure? I think, uh, Karan, the whole story is so complex, as you know, and unfortunately, in the India-Pakistan relationship, we move one step forward and then we move two steps back. And uh, I think uh, the Pakistan Foreign Minister, Sartar Jaziz, is absolutely right. He did, in a sense, regret what happened. So if you remember when Nawaz Sharif came in, in May for the Narendra Modi swearing in, he did not speak to the Hurriyat leaders. So I think Nawaz was reaching out and the Indian government responded. What happened later on the cancellation of the foreign secretary level talks was very, very unfortunate. I think that uh, Nawaz Sharif felt he was let down by Narendra Modi and uh, the government, by the Indian government. And clearly, there is so much pressure on Nawaz Sharif by his own army that he feels very boxing. much boxed into a corner. And I think that's why he's making these statements, which frankly don't mean very much. For him to say, I'm going to only speak to the Kashmiri leaders before I speak to India, also doesn't mean very much. Sure, he's going to speak to his own leaders in Muzaffarabad, but which Hurriyat leaders or which Kashmiri leaders is he going to speak to from India and how and where? You know, leave that aside. Because that's a problem for Nawaz Sharif to, an to answer. Sathya Pratpal, as one looks at the Pakistani position, is there a certain element of confusion about whether you should talk to Hurit or not? Not just between Nawaz Sharif's position as example when he came in May, or, or in terms of what Sartaj Aziz said, and the army's position, but also within the civilians, because there's a difference of opinion between Nawaz and what Sardar said in uh, New York. You know, quite frankly, the Hurriyat is being give, given an importance in this whole uh, mess that they don't deserve. But that's from the Pakistani side? Uh, from our side. I, I think if the Pakistani High Commissioner was masquerading as a chaiwala to the Hurriyat, we should have simply ignored it. Because it, it simply doesn't matter. It, by blowing them up, giving them a completely inflated sense of their own importance in the overall scheme of things, We've now made it impossible for the Pakistanis to ignore them. But what about my point? Is there a confusion within the Pakistani position, I A, between civilian and military, and B, within the civilian government too? I don't think there is a confusion. I think it is it's well accepted on all sides that the Hurriyat isn't really a potent political force. And at the appropriate time, should we be sensible and talk seriously to the Pakistanis and come close to a resolution of, our, of, the, of the dialogue, they will be told what the two countries have agreed upon. But at the moment, you can't expect the Pakistanis to just resign from their stated position. Before I come to Kamal Sibyl, I want to put something else to you, Aziz Ahmed Khan. If you look carefully at what Nawaz Sharif said yesterday, there seems to be either a potential contradiction or at least a potential confusion in his thinking. Because on the one hand, he says, it's our fundamental belief that the Kashmir issue should be resolved through dialogue. Now, that dialogue has to happen primarily with the Indian government. But if Nawaz Sharif then goes on to insist on prior talks with the separatists before he talks to the Indian government, he'll never talk to the Indian government. So, it seems to me, prima facie, there's at least confusion, if not contradiction, in his own stated words. I don't see any confusion, uh, Karan. I, 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 there, there is dialogue with India as far as resolution of an issue is concerned, and in order to be able to well to be well equipped to move positively in the resolution of that problem, we need to have opinions from all sides. It is only fair that one should move forward if the, in a manner where the progress that we make is acceptable to all the people of Kashmir of different and varying uh, but, but, opinions. But, but, but. And that is the only way a meaningful dialogue process can move forward. But you know, it's not the fact that, of your, that the talking to the Hurriyat would be a problem. It's the sequencing of the talking that I'm really pointing out. Sartaj Aziz in New York clearly agreed that the sequencing could happen no. after, not before talking to the Indian government. That wouldn't have created half as much of a problem. Why is your Prime Minister insisting on prior talks as if those talks themselves are a condition to talking to the Indian government? That sequencing is what's scuppering the whole situation. No, Sartaj Aziz Saab referred only to a particular incident on a particular day. and and. 
perhaps uh, and probably in a different context which pro may, may not have got a uh, clear expression the f that was with relation to that particular moment as okay. far as consulting the leadership is concerned of or shades of opinion of different Kashmiris I think uh, it's only fair that one should know what their thinking is so that it can also be taken into consideration while okay. if the two sides are sitting together and discussing a resolution of the issue Councilman, I want to ask you two questions, one after another. First, to begin with this issue of sequencing. Mm. Would it be more acceptable to the Indian government if the consultations Pakistan feels for political reasons that it has to have with the Kashmiri separatists happen after it's spoken to the Indian government? So it's not done as a precondition, but it's done as a consequence and follow-up. I think this is a complex question you're asking me. I, I, if you if you look at the Indian position logically, it would appear that they will not tolerate any direct conversations between the Pakistani government and the Hurriyat and the separatist leaders and the sequencing in this context is not important. However, one can envisage a situation where uh, the Hurriyat uh, decide uh, to go to a third country and they have talks with the Pakistani leadership. Then what will the government of India do? because they would then be dealing with the situation ex post facto. Uh, and therefore, I, I, I would say that uh, Pakistan would be well advised not to go down this road. And I have, in fact, uh, a serious question in mind uh, on the basis of what Aziz Khan has just said, because he is beginning the whole process by saying we don't recognize that Kashmir is part of India. It, the people are not part of India. It's disputed territory. Therefore, we have a right to talk to everyone. Now, if you have such a hardline position where you want to interpret the existence of this dispute entirely in your favor, then I can't see the basis, any logical basis okay. for continuing a serious or a meaningful dialogue, as he says, on Kashmir. And then would he also then agree that uh, the people from Baltistan and Gilgit and all the all the fellows who are not happy with Pakistan yeah. should meet the Prime Minister of India? Le I mean, then you are complicating the matter much further. Well, let's simplify it because that is always the better thing for us to do. And let me therefore come to my second question to you. Next week, both Nawaz Sharif and Narendra Modi will be in Nepal for the Sark Summit. Now, clearly, any hope or possibility that they might have a pull aside formal meeting has now been completely dashed. But is there a possibility that in their conversations, not formal meetings, just conversations as undoubtedly would happen at the retreat, they could find a way of sorting out this impasse? I don't think so. Not for the time being. It may happen in due course of time, I can't say. Uh, because positions may evol evolve on both sides. But at this point, uh, for uh, our Prime Minister to yield ground on, on this point, given the statements that have come from Nawaz Sharif, would make it very difficult because it would mean as if, after having taken a tough position, he just stepped back. It is okay. a question also of his credibility. But it's more than a question of credibility. There's a substantive issue involved. You know, Jyoti Malhotra, as one looks at it, trying to be objective, it seems as if both Prime Ministers have actually played to their domestic audiences for whatever their individual reasons and as a result they've both boxed themselves into a corner. Would you agree? I would absolutely agree. But I also think, Karan, that uh, Prime Minister Modi has surprised us before. After all, he did invite all the SARC leaders, including Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, for his swearing in. And I'd like to go back to the same question. When Nawaz Sharif did not meet the Hurriyat leaders when he came here in May, why is it such a big deal for for Pakistan now to meet the Hurriyat. I think there there is some black something black in the lentils that we don't see here. After all, is it that the Pakistan High Commissioner met the Hurriyat leaders and, and you know But so you're anyway, now hoping not for Modi to surprise us, but Nawaz Sharif no, to surprise I think, us I by think, changing his no, position. I'd also like to say that uh, Prime Minister Modi has really conquered the world. When he, before he goes to Kathmandu in a few days. You know, he's been to America, he's been to Australia and... and Europe every, doesn't feature and in your And everywhere world. in between. No, I think he has been... But I think he has to... We are, we are in this region, okay. we live here, we belong here, and I think we have to reach out. People are making silly mistakes all the time. That doesn't mean that the people of India and Pakistan have to suffer just because our leaderships haven't okay. been able to you're, you're, to... you're you're hoping that both prime ministers coming face to face in the cooler climes of Columb uh, of Kathmandu will actually somehow warm to each other I and do something miraculous. I, I absolutely am saying that.
We don't know if that's going to happen. Let's leave that aside. Let me come then to a second issue with you, Satya Pratpa. Nawaz Sharif also said something else yesterday. He said the government was proactively highlighting Kashmir at every international forum, but also, oddly enough, almost contradictorily, he accepted that he was concerned by the silence of the UN and the international community. Has he therefore unintendedly accepted or admitted that his attempts to internationalize Kashmir haven't worked? Yes, I think he has. And I think that is something that the Pakistanis have recognized for a long time. I mean, they have been saying for a long time that they are surprised that neither the UN nor their friends in the international community any longer are prepared to, to bring any pressure to bear on India. I think it's simply a fact of diplomatic life that Pakistan simply cannot persuade its friends now to take up the issue of Kashmir with India. And therefore, uh, these attempts, if they are being made, are not very successful, so nor will they not, be. Is it not unwise of Mr. Nawaz Sharif to keep talking about how he's going to raise it proactively when he has to go on to admit he's concerned by the international silence? I mean, he's giving the game away before he starts? I, I, in a way, he is. But that has been the position in, in Pakistan for quite some time now. You know, Aziz Ahmed Khan, it wasn't just Mr. Sharif who raised Kashmir in his UN General Assembly speech in September this year, but shortly after that, Mr. Sataj Aziz wrote personally to the five permanent security members of the Security Council. Now, given the lack of response, do people, public opinion, the press in Pakistan accept that this attempt to internationalize Kashmir simply isn't working? You see, there is one aspect of Kashmir issue is the UN aspect, the international aspect of the Kashmir issue, which is there and which is a reality. It is it is an agenda on the item of the uh, on the on the uh, agenda item on the Security Council. The other fact is that Pakistan has also attempted to find an amicable solution to the Kashmir dispute through bilateral talks and negotiations, a solution which is acceptable to the all three parties involved, that is India, Pakistan and the people of Kashmir. So we are not, uh, one is not in contradiction of the other. We have made attempts in the past to resolve the issue bilaterally. We are still willing to move ahead and resolve it bilaterally. But for that, there has to be a process which should be started and which should be consistent and which should be positive. You know, I want to come back, Kamal Sibyl, to this question of how much success is Pakistan having in trying to raise the issue internationally, because that's clearly what Mr. Nawaz Sharif says is his declared proactive ambition. The truth is, even when the recent ceasefire violations were at their height, and they were perhaps the worst violations since the ceasefire came into being in 2003, the situation didn't really attract international concern beyond the single statement by the UN Secretary General and concerns expressed by two United States senators. Does that suggest that the world, regardless of what Pakistan tries, is unlikely to interfere and intervene in the Kashmir issue because they've come to the conclusion, that is to say the world's come to the conclusion, this is a matter best left to the two countries. Well, you know, in actual fact, Pakistan has lost uh, tremendous ground internationally. And they have exposed themselves in what they have been doing in Afghanistan. The fact that they have been involved in terrorism there and actually involved in the killing of uh, American soldiers indirectly and the game that they are playing with the Akani group and everybody else. Uh, and then the discourse on the West has changed completely. The recent Pentagon report came out clearly mm. with what they now think about Pakistan's uh, policies and using terrorists and militants to settle scores uh, uh, with India and, and make up for their relative uh, inferiority in uh, conventional arms. Uh, so in this context, I don't think the world is uh, going to take what Pakistan says about Kashmir uh, very seriously. But I have a more fundamental question. When Aziz Khan says that we want to settle the Kashmir issue bilaterally, well, what does he want? What does, what does Pakistan want? What do they mean? Well, well, just a moment. Do they want more territory in Jammu well, and Kashmir? Well, well, let's, as simple I, that, that, as that, 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 that question. Uh, we are now jumping well ahead of ourselves, and that's a different discussion altogether. You're right to raise it as an issue, but that is an issue that will be clarified only when the talks begin. So let's not jump into that. That's a huge red herring at this moment. Let me come back to the nub of the issue Aziz yes. Ahmed Khan made there by the former Foreign Secretary that today, for whatever reasons he cited, the world is no longer willing or wanting to listen to Pakistan's special pleas on Kashmir. So even though your Prime Minister says he's going to proactively raise this at every single international forum, he's meeting with no success and he's admitting it. 
because he's admitting to the silence and he's complaining about the silence of the international community. So since no one's listening to him, why keep banging on a door no one wants to open? Give it up. Why should one give up on a principled position that one has consistently adhered to over the last uh, so many years, so many decades, that the, if the world is not responding does not mean that one should stop trying. I okay. mean, there is a certain, an, an issue which needs to be resolved. There was a course taken to resolve that issue, which was which India took to the United Nations uh, for a resolution. There were difficulties in implementing of those resolutions. That's a different matter. We then also thought that let us try, give it a uh, try bilaterally. Okay. We are attempting that there as well. If we can, if we can manage to find an amicable resolution bilaterally, then that would be the end of the matter. All right. At least your position has the but. We, can, of we have to continue even if it uh, doesn't have the blessing of success. Both the tracks. Let me put it like this. If the world is happy to leave the Kashmir situation to India and Pakistan to sort out, and they're not going to intervene no matter how hard Nawaz Sharif tries, then does it not also mean, as a corollary, that no one's going to bang the heads together of our two prime ministers and knock sense into them and say, listen, folks, talk for your own sakes. And therefore, the consequence is that the future of talks looks bleak. I think the future of talks uh, does look very bleak, Karan. The world has moved on. They have enough problems of their own. There is the ISIS problem in Iraq and Turkey and Syria and Libya. And, you know, there's, uh, the, the Europe is not doing very well financially, economically. The Americans have other headaches. Afghanistan is a huge issue. I think, but listen, let's forget about the world. I think it is in India's interest to talk to all its neighbors. After all, we are going to the SARC summit. And what is SARC about? And I think uh, they, if you, you know, uh, uh, one piece of good news is that India has signed on to a regional road transport yeah. uh, 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 agreement. Stick yes, but I, I think so. If, if there is a SARC uh, agreement, and I think India and Pakistan do really need to get on and talk about Kashmir. Satyabhad, let me end by putting this to you. Does it suit India, as Mr. Modi and his government see India's interest, that the world outside is not going to put any pressure on us to talk to Pakistan? And given the condition we've said Pakistan doesn't meet it and therefore talks won't happen. Does this situation suit India? It certainly suits the present government. There will be absolutely no pressure at all on it to talk to Pakistan. The only change in this would be if things really fall apart. And that is the danger. That is the danger. Do you mean on the ceasefire line? On the ceasefire line or elsewhere. And, and, and the problem is that when the, the Pakistani army has felt that Pakistan is being ignored, it has tried to create a situation which will force international attention. That is the risk Mr. Modi's that policy runs. Risk. That's right. All right. right, let's leave it there. We have to now wait and see whether that risk is realized. And if it is, God forbid how it's handled. But for now, we come to the end of this particular discussion. My thanks to both of you for coming to the studio. My thanks also to Aziz Ahmed Khan and Kamal Sibyl for joining us. <laughs>